Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series on the Cross Border Interviews. And today we are pleased to welcome to the show town mayor for the town of Legal, Alberta, Trina Jones. Mayor Jones, welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Thank you for having me. This is great. I love it. <laughs> um, so I, I I love talking with local elected officials from across Canada, and I like getting to know who they are and why they chose municipal government. So I want to start with the question I've asked all political people on the show. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, uh, I think with a lot of people, it started, you know, when the kids hit preschool and soccer, minor sports, all that kind of stuff. So you start out with you know, fundraising, you know, the bake sales, and then you end up on parent council, you end up, you know, helping with the soccer clubs and, and moving on to like town festivals, volunteering with all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, uh, my husband and a couple of friends made the joke, well, why don't you just run for council? And uh, <laughs> that started the, the conversation. And uh, here we are 12 years later. Had you wanted to run for uh, political office beforehand, or was that something that's not even on your radar? Because a lot of people say they grew up with politics, so that's what got them involved. And other people say, like you, it was a joke, and the joke became reality one election. <laughs> um, if you'd asked me 15, 20 years ago if I'd be sitting in this spot right now, I, I probably said you were crazy. Um, but it, it really came down to... I was volunteering. I was helping the community. I wanted to do more. And uh, so that's where it, it jumped to. And I have thoroughly enjoyed the last 12 years of my life. It, it, it's been a wonderful job. So let's talk about 2010 when you first entered the political arena. So in 2010, was there an issue that was pressing for the town of Legal, or was it just you wanted to give back and wanted to sort of step up and help the community uh, in a different way than you were doing prior to getting involved? And the most pressing issues at that time, I think, were, you know, recreation for kids and young adults. Uh, there was doctor recruitment. We had a new subdivision on the go. So there was growth happening. And I had some ideas and how to help those things along. And it just evolved from there. You know, issues are ever changing. So, you know, you move on from those smaller issues to, you know, the big ones like uh, funding and, and tourism and development and all that kind of fun stuff later on. Did you... When you were knocking on doors in that first election, because I'm assuming you had the pulse of the community, you you, you knew what your community you thought you needed. Were there issues that you knocked on your door, uh, people's doors and you went, oh, I didn't think this was an issue. I'm glad people are talking about it. But you talk about recreation. You talked about the new subdivision. You talked about tourism. But were there issues that you went, oh, I didn't think this was an issue, but I'm glad people are talking about it. Oh, I I think the one that kind of surprised me, you know, people were generally happy with, you know, the, the condition of our town. Our town is super beautiful. Uh, we have some great public works people who take their job extremely seriously. But, you know, there was a few people that I talked to that were worried about their curbs um, and, and the cracks and the conditions of them. Uh, so I hadn't really thought about infrastructure funding and, and that kind of thing at that point but it fat quickly rose to you know top of mind issue so it that one surprised me a little bit in 2010 and now I'm you know, dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> you 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 go into the ballot box for the very first time uh in 2010 and I remember the first time walking to my first ballot box and seeing my name on the ballot it is a surreal experience because at least you know you get one vote at least at the end of the day <laughs> one person is voting for you what was that moment like for you seeing your name on that ballot and putting that x or that check mark beside it uh, agreed it's a little surreal like oh my god am I really gonna do this um uh, I, I think it really hit me that night when we're counting those ballots and realizing I am now a, a legal counselor. It, that, that was the, the big hit, you know. Um, we went out to the new mayor, or well, I guess the former mayor's house. We all sat around. We had a big discussion and chat, got to know each other. And, you know, he shook my hand at the end of the night and said, welcome to council. And, you know, that was the impact for me. And I think that was a, one of the defining moments anyway. <laughs> so does that, oh, crap, what have I done moment ever change for you? Because 
I, you seem like a very personal person and we've only been chatting for like five minutes so far. And I feel like you're very personal, very bubbly, very outgoing. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, I can't see how someone like you can go from this is going to be fine to, oh, what have I gotten myself into? I'm now a counselor and the day-to-day -day decisions that I'm going to be making are going to be affecting my neighbors, my family. When does that moment of, oh no, turn to, I've got this. Or is it still um, that, oh no, what have I gotten myself into <laughs> after 12 years? <laughs> Depending on the decision, you know, every so often. But, you know, every four years we go through this all over again. The campaigning starts and the door knocking starts and the, okay, do I really want to do this again? Am I up for this for another four years? And then, um, it's, it kind of comes in cycles and then I run for election for the Alberta municipalities board and again that that hits you again where you're like oh my god what am I getting into and then that first meeting hits and it, it's kind of ever changing but there's always you know every so often you get that oh, oh my god what am I doing <laughs> and because I can imagine, because Legal is a small community and you can't go to the grocery store, or you can't go down to the post office to pick up your mail without people approaching you and asking about day-to-day -day issues. How do you balance that whole idea that you're an elected official, but also the decisions you make, you can't hide from those decisions. Those decisions are going to be talked about and you're going to hear about those decisions. Unlike provincial politicians who go to Edmonton or federal politicians who go to Ottawa, you're the front line. You're going to hear about the decisions you make. Um, generally, people are really good. You know, every so often you, you do get somebody who yells at you about something. But at the end of the day, you're trying to do what you think is best for the community. There's four other people on this council that I can lean on. They can lean on me. We all share these conversations. We all have a pretty good pulse on this community. Uh, and, you know, when we do hear that negative feedback, we try and do something about it. You know, okay, maybe what, what can we change differently? What can we do differently? Or, you know, and you're, you're all doing that process every time you make a decision when you hear the positive comments, you know, it's, it, A, it's amazing, but that the positive comments usually have to do with more of an operational thing, which comes back to our staff who do, the, do that amazing job. Uh, personally, uh, you know, my friends know that, you know, for hanging out, you know, at wing night at the pub, politics is off the table. They don't want to talk about their jobs. They, they you know, so we kind of, you can maneuver around it, you know. Okay, <laughs> I have interviewed a lot of people on this show, and you were the first person that has told me, I think honestly, because I think sometimes some people are blowing smoke, <laughs> but you say, when I'm out at the pub, my friends know it's just Trina right now. It's not Mayor Jones, it's Trina. Yeah. You must have good friends, because I can imagine <laughs> it. I, I have fr I have counselors and MLAs who used to come over to my place all the time, and I'm I, I I'm talking to them about politics no matter what time of day it is. So, <laughs> is it important for you and even local elected officials to have a core group of supporters or even friends to sort of have that relationship with to sort of say, okay, when I'm with you, I don't want to talk about day to day politics. I do that. 23 hours a day already i don't want to be doing it 24 is it important to have that balance in your life absolutely it's critical because if you run this life you're constantly in politics you're constantly delving into things you're constantly thinking about policy you're never going to have that downtime and i've seen it happen where you know folks get overwhelmed and they they don't how, know how to take that stress break so like with anybody else's job you can't do that 24 7 your brain needs a break <laughs> did it come and, easy to you though because after 12 years i'm assuming you've mastered it but for the first <laughs> few years you've probably because anyone who gets into an elected official role you want you want to do your best right you want to be the best and you're willing to take those nine o'clock phone calls from your residents or that eight o'clock phone call from your resident in the morning when you're getting ready for the kids to go to school after a certain amount of time, have you found that magic sweet spot where you're able to balance that? Or 
are there days that you do slip into those? I'll take that nine o'clock call because you know what? I need to, and this person's been waiting for three weeks to hear back from me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not going to be every day. Okay. You know, I'm going to turn off the phone at seven o'clock. It's, you know, or I'm going to take this day completely off. There isn't, there isn't that aspect to it. Yes. You have to take those nine o'clock calls, maybe responding to emails at 6 a.m., you know, but you still need that break time. And, you know, I do, there have been, you know, Saturday nights, I turn my phone off, it stays in the house and I go sit on my friend's patio and we have a drink Uh, or, you know, leave the phone at home when I walk the dog. You have to do that with any job, any career, any, any aspect of your life, really, you have to take that time to decompress. You can't be on all the time. (laughs) How does a local elected officials, particularly from a small community like Legal, balance the needs and wants of your community? Because if I go to your community tomorrow and I go talk to a hundred people in your community or even 20 people from your community, I guarantee you they will all have 20 different issues that are important to them. And that's the key thing that I want to say state here is important to them. You as mayor, you as the five elected officials on council have to decide at the end of the day, what's the most important issue for the town to move forward while remembering the issues that your community believes in is important to them. How do you balance that? Because everyone's issue is the most important to them, but you have to decide who the winners and losers are. I try not to think of it as winners and losers. Okay. Um, it, it's, I, I have 1300 people in this community that I'm accountable to, you know, one person, it's more, you know, the, the pothole up the street, that's their critical issue today. Um, somebody else, it's the hockey rink, uh, somebody else, it's doctor recruitment. So we tackle those issues on a daily basis, but, you know, when we're thinking about our road plans, you know, we are, we're going to address that pothole when we're thinking of economic development, you know, that doctor recruitment rolls into it. Uh, maybe I'm not a hockey parent, but maybe I go up to the arena and, you know, cheer on somebody else, or, uh, I, go curling or, you know, different things are going to affect different people differently, but all in all, it's one big community. And when we can roll those smaller aspects into our bigger plans, it's going to make our life easier and our residents' lives easier. How important is it for communication to play into a factor in that? Because uh, (laughs) do you have to sit down with people and say okay unfortunately we can't get to this issue this year but it is in our strategic plan or in our priority for year x compared to year y that we're currently in oh it, crit- communication is critical um we use our newsletter we use facebook we use instagram we use the website uh, we use local newspapers you know to get that information out and if somebody comes to us and says uh well, why aren't you tackling this issue? This issue? Well, you, we've built out our four-year plans. We're working through our budgets. It's on the list, you know, fiscal constraints or land or whatever other resources may not, it may not happen this year, but I promise you it's on our radar. And if it if it's one of those things that hasn't come up on our radar, we bring it to council, we have that discussion and then communicate back to the residents about you know, what we decided on. Okay. So I'm a former communication uh, coordinator for a town in my previous uh, life. And I know towns and municipalities try to communicate to everyone. They do, like you said, Facebook, they do uh, newspaper, they do bulletin boards, they try every scenario. But there, I guarantee you there's at least one person in your town that say, well, I didn't get it. I didn't get that notice. What are you doing? Why are you doing this instead of this part? How do you communicate in a air in a community like your uh, Legal, where not everyone is going to say that they got it when you only can do as much unless you want to spend your whole budget on communications? You're not going to be able to communicate to everyone unless you go door to door and then make sure you, they hear it and then say it to them five times to remember it. Unfortunately, that's going to be a reality with any town. Um, you know, 
Oh, you didn't hear. Oh, did you did you read it about in the La Gallery? Uh, did you check out the town Facebook page? I know we posted it two days ago. Oh, we put that in the free press. Uh, oh, it, it's been on our website for a little while. If you go on this page, click here. Oh, did you check out my mayor page on Facebook? Uh, yeah, aside from going, you know, bang, bang, bang. Hey, we have a hockey program going. You know, it's you're not going to reach everyone. And I, I think, unfortunately, that's just a reality of life. Um, but <laughs> we do as much as humanly possible. And, and for those who didn't hear some sort of information, you direct them to where they could get further information. No. And if all else fails, come into the office, chat with us. That's it's pretty easy. <laughs> now, now you, the town of Legal is a unique entity within Alberta, according to your website, because I'm one of those people that actually goes to websites <laughs> and reads them before interviews. You are one of the few towns in the province of Alberta that is a bilingual community. Special. So you're not just communicating in English. I'm assuming you're communicating in French as well. How big of a population of Legal is bilingual? Would you say about 100% or like, oh. is it 50% or what? what's the magic number? Because I, I don't know what a... Oh, sorry, I just want to make sure I get this right here. According to your website, proud to be recognized as a bilingual community. So how do you get recognized as a bilingual community in the province of Alberta? So that happened before my time on council, <laughs> I believe 20 something years ago. So I don't know the exact process, but... <laughs> but you're, you're still bilingual today, right? Like you're still recognized as a bilingual community as of 2023. I have to remember what year we in at the time. <laughs> Yeah, um, all of our official communications are in English. Um, okay. If we're working with the Francophone, uh, well, we have a Francophone school board that operates in town. We have the Francophone Association. We do a lot of communications through them and we do join initiatives and stuff like that. I'm not sure of the exact percentage that consider themselves bilingual, um, but I know it's less than what it was 20 years ago. Our demographics have changed. Um, you know, we We've welcomed a lot of military families into town. We've welcomed a lot of, uh, you know, uh, industry people. So, you know, they maybe work out of town or they're coming in from another province. So that aspect of it has changed. However, uh, even my family here, uh, my, well, my husband's family, I guess, are, are Francophone. So it's... Oh. There, there, there's that dynamic where we still do have a lot of French speaking folks uh, that but you know not quite as many as we used to but it's been an incredible advantage to us because we, we get that diversity we get new people in we get people who come here specifically because there is that francophone population and the francophone school and the association and and that ability to to feel at home when they move into our community Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years, and to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. We're going to talk about tourism a little bit later. There's another part on your website that I need to read out because it paints an amazing uh, picture of your community. But before I do that, I want to turn to the town as a whole. And I mm -hmm. want to preface this question because we often get random emails from people in communities <laughs> saying, well, this isn't a direction of council. Well, it's not. It's an opinion from the mayor talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. This is not a direction of council. This is not an, opi uh, an opinion of the or emotion at council. This is the mayor's opinion. <laughs> so 
Mayor Jones, the question I have is, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue today facing the town of Legale? Growth. How so? Uh, we, it, we've had a lot of infill over the last few years. We've had the subdivision fill up. Uh, uh, we have, we're, we're in a weird situation where if you build it, they will come. Really? Um, people want to move to our community. And that, that's a great thing. And that, I, that's I an amazing that. issue to have. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm 90 percent sure every other person uh, who's been on my show would like be envious of that statement. <laughs> yeah, we have the folks that want to move to our community, and I'd say 90 something percent of our our houses are the single family, you know, yard, you know, uh, kind of situation. But we're we're lacking a little bit in, you know, those starter homes or, you know, maybe duplexes, the, the smaller town homes and stuff like that. So what we really need right now is a, a developer to come in, work with us. We, we've, we've got land, we've got the opportunity, we've got the will, we've got everything except for that one little piece. So we want to grow. We are growing. People want to help us grow. We just need that that one little puzzle piece that hasn't quite happened yet. So how do you find that puzzle piece? Because I can imagine um, in today's era with high cost of living, high inflation, developers aren't building as quickly as they used to in the 80s and the 90s and even early 2000s before the 2008 financial crisis. How do you as mayor lobby developers or even builders to come to your community and say, hey, look at our community. We are growing. People want to build here. Your return on investment is going to be large while still understanding that the cost of doing business now is a lot higher than it was three, four years ago. So we used to have local developers and local builders who were, who were building and that's where the subdivision came into force was a, a local guy and he built that. So what we're doing now is we've set up an economic development committee. We're working with our staff. It's within our strategic plan, our MDP, our LUB, every plan we can kind of come up with. And we're moving forward on those plans now to start that recruitment, to start that, the, I guess, networking, uh, you know, really showing off what our community has, who wants to be here. You know, it, it's it's an evolving process at the moment because we we have had to change tactics. So we're, we're working through the log logistics of that right now. And for those detractors who would say, I don't want that. I don't want the city to grow. I don't want the town to grow. I want it to be the way it is because some people move to a town like Legal and they want that small town feeling and they like that small town feeling and they don't want it to grow. I, I, I lived in Northern Alberta for a while and I can tell you that whenever there was talk of a proposed subdivision, some locals would be very upset. How do you balance the needs of the small town feel against the growth that you want to see happen in your community? Because as mayor, you have to do that delicate balancing act. It really comes down to survivability of your community. Um, do you want to be able to go to the post office? Well, yeah. Well, then the post office has to stay viable. Do you want the grocery store to stay here? Well, of course. Well, then we need people to support that. We and you don't get that support from people who exist here. Um, while we're 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 buying our bread and we're buying our milk and, and you know going to the post office and stuff, we need to expose new people to those things and have them support it. And if we want those services to grow, we need the people to grow. <laughs> have, so, have you seen growth it, in your twelve years in office? Absolutely. Uh, I believe when I got on council, I think we were sitting at around 1,100 people and we're up to around 1,300 now. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that's amazing it, for a small town. It, it's not exponential, uh, thankfully, actually, because, you know, you, we don't want to grow by 50% in the next two years, you know? <laughs> so what's but, an achievable goal? What's the achievable goal that the town of Legal has set out for themselves? Because everyone knows that 
behind the books, you, you've probably got like a number that you'd like to see <laughs> by like 10, 15 years from now, what you'd like to see the town of Legal grow by like 200, 300, or is it like a hundred even? Well, I, I think we, we've seen growth rates as high as 10% and that's attainable for us. So that's roughly 130 people. Um, when, that's between census years, of course. Yeah. So, you know, year over year, I'd say three to 5% is very doable. I mean, that's a few new families, that's enrollment in our schools. If we see 10% in a year, I mean, great. Um, we just got to figure out how to manage that as well. Where, where to house them is basically where is the big <laughs> thing. Um, we talk about affordability a lot, it's particularly around housing. But like I've said beforehand, the cost of living is going up. And uh, I'm not sure if you're done your budget uh, process for 2023 yet, or you're still in the middle of the deliberation. Um, this budget is kind of a hard budget for a lot of communities right now. And you as the elected official have to decide how do you keep pace with inflation, but also don't do it on the backs of your residents and your neighbors. How has the town of Legal been able, uh, are they, how are they navigating through this weird moment in our time where we don't want to strain our residents by putting more money, taking money out of their pocketbooks, but understanding that things have to go up because the cost of living has to go up, is going up, I should say. It doesn't have to go up, but it's going up. <laughs> I, I think a lot of our residents understand that. Um, we, we've all seen the news. We have all read the papers. We, we all know the economic, economic um, outlook for not just the town, but the province, the, the country. Um, and for the last two years, we've, we haven't increased taxes. Uh, we, we've gone 0% for 21 and 22. And the, the reality is, I don't think we can do that this year. Uh, we've got some major projects on the go that we're, we're absolutely finding funding for, we're uh, taking advantage of every grant opportunity that we can find. But it's the basic services, you know, uh, we want to be able to offer the mom and pop and tots. We want to be able to keep our soccer fields up to par. And I, I think our residents understand that. Um, I agree. Nobody wants their taxes to go. I don't want my taxes to go up. <laughs> but it's becoming a reality. And unfortunately, with the province kind of clawing back some funding, doing some downloading, it it has become increasingly difficult for us. And now, I think the municipality in, in the provinces is, is, is heading that way too. Well, I was about to ask that question because in your other role, you're the vice president of small town, small towns Eastern yes. in Alberta. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a very weird, long title and I always it got is. it messed up. <laughs> so I'm the director for Towns East. Okay. So that means I represent uh, anybody classified as a town from uh, Lac La Biche down to Stetler, Highway 2 to the Saskatchewan border. And then I also sit on the executive committee as the vice president of towns, which is all towns in Alberta. Okay. So two different question... roles pushed into one. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. So the question that I was going to ask is are all municipalities facing the same issues that Legal is facing right now when it comes to that affordability question? Because I can imagine there is a lot of communities right now who are looking to the province and saying, okay, we need something, but the province is saying, well, right now we're not sure what we're going to give you or what we want to give you. So how do, how are municipal uh, uh, towns, particularly small towns dealing with this uncertainty, particularly around this 2023 budget uh, cycle? I think we're all kind of in the same boat, a different varying degrees. Um, and we, we don't know what the funding allocation is going to be from the province. We don't know which grants are going to be there, which ones are going to be pulled off, which ones may be expanded. We, we just don't know that information until the province drops that budget uh, in end of February, I believe it is. Uh, we just won't have those answers. So do so, you budget in 2023 understanding that you don't know so you have to like take that out of the equation when you're budgeting in a small town and say okay we don't know what's coming so we can't assume that we're going to get something that might not even be on the table so if we get it yay that's good then we can actually do something else but right now we have to budget like we're not getting anything pretty much 
Uh, we do wow. know our MSL allocation uh, for 2023, and I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but we do know what that number is because it was kind of put in the budget, the provincial budget from last year. However, moving forward, we don't know what that's going to be for 24, 25, 26. So we have to budget our projects as if we're not getting any of that money, as if we're not, as, as if there's nothing else coming in. And that's an unfortunate thing because we see our tax bills going up and then we have to kind of justify that. Um, what we do, and I know a lot of other small towns and villages do this as well, we pass interim budgets at the end of December. So that's, we kind of allocate 50% of what we spent last year to keep us operationally sound and, and everything like that. And then once the education requisitions come in, the funding announcements come in, then we can concrete our budget. Uh, we do have a draft right now um, that we're actually going to be working through on the 31st where we have a full day planned and sit down with administration, go line by line, you know, try and figure out exactly what we want, what we need and what can be, you know, maybe moved off for a year or so. But yeah, you're always stuck in that. Well, what's what's coming and, and what's the province going to throw at us this year? <laughs> It's we're always in that uh, perpetual unknown, it seems like, and particularly in uh, local government. But I want to ask the last question before we turn to our last segment here. And that is the needs of your community against the needs of the one, because we've already talked a little about a little bit beforehand. But during a budget cycle, you have to take all the information you have from residents, what they want from nonprofit groups, what they need. And you have to decide. You said the last two years have been tough. You had kept it at a 0% increase with this year coming up. Is it tougher, even though you're looking at a potential increase, not saying that there is as of recording, we don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> is it hard to say, okay, we're going to increase your bill your taxes, residents, you're going to have to understand that things do go up and we need to pay for things, but you're not going to see a large growth in the service levels that we provide. We're going to keep our service levels the same. We may be able to offer one or two things. We're going to see some infrastructure projects. The needs and wants that people are going to be requesting may not happen this year because Right now, we're just looking at the potential growth of the city. Yeah, so uh, the needs of the one, uh, the many versus the one, I mean, it's very, it is very hard to grapple with for somebody, maybe not myself, because I do know that those ins and outs of the budget process, I do know the ins and outs of the granting and all that kind of fun stuff. So we have the, to communicate. I like how you called it the fun stuff. I like how you call granting <laughs> fun stuff. You were the first <laughs> mayor to call grant fun stuff. Okay. This is this it stop is, it the is press fun it. because we get to go, yay, we got money. But <laughs> but um I'll, I'll give you a great example. We uh have just received a grant from the federal government for eight point one million dollars, and that is to do a complete retrofit on our arena. Our arena is 60 years old. It's falling apart. We've done the assessments and everything like that. We still have to come up with another $2 million to complete the project. Mm. So when, but when we're looking for the, that money or we're trying to access other grants, we're trying to budget for that. We, you know, looking at our reserves, trying to figure out all of that stuff to come up with that extra $2 million. If we do this project and we get the energy retrofits, we get the expanded community areas, we get all that. It's going to benefit so many, so many more people than just, say, a hockey club. You know, um, if we do the energy retrofits, our bills go down, which means we don't have to charge our residents so much. If we can offer that extra community space, we can run other programs. Uh, we can offer that space to volunteer groups. Um, there, there's a lot of even that one project, maybe it's just one building, but there's other things you can do with that that add to your community benefit. Couldn't agree more on that. Sorry, I had to I had to mute myself. My dogs were barking upstairs. God bless Amazon <laughs> that delivers during an interview. Um, I want to turn to my last segment now, and this is my favorite segment because it's about tourism. I love visiting uh, small communities because 
we often forget about the tourism draws that communities have in our province and our country. And we always talk about the big things, but I want to talk about tourism. And before I do that, I want to start with this quote that's on the town of Legal's website that paints an amazing photo that makes me want to not only visit, but move there. So, and I'm quoting here in Legal, <laughs> you can expect that everyone will wave at you and say hi as they pass you on the street. If you enjoy an afternoon out during a local festival or event, you will be served fresh foods that taste just like grandma's cooking. As a family-friendly, safe community, we welcome you to take a moment to experience the peacefulness of our community, to take part in our local traditions and make lasting memories together. Um, Mayor Jones, uh, <laughs> Uh, you got like a Pleasantville going on up there, don't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> so, we, our, uh, our community is amazing. I, I love this place. And well, obviously, because that's why I'm here. But yeah, just people, you know, drive by in the street, you know, maybe they're not honking at you. They're honking at, you know, Auntie Barb that's walking up the street, but you're waving anyways. You know, it, it's... And, it's just force of habit, you know, you, you see somebody, you get a hug in the post office, you know, or anybody waves at anybody, or you get, you get a nice smile. So you know. what, what are the tourist draws that people should come and see in Legal if they're passing through? Because every community has a unique situation, particularly a unique uh, tourist draw. What's the town of Legal's? Well, aside from our numerous events throughout the year, which we're um, going to talk about, because I want to know what what event smells like burnt ketchup, because that's what my grandma's taste uh, cooking tasted like. So, <laughs> yes, and she knew it. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think we got burnt ketchup, but um, no, <laughs> we are the francophone mural capital of Canada. Uh, so we, I, I think, we're up to forty two murals. And there's kind of scattered around town that we've got, uh, they're in our skate park, they're on the side of the arena, they're on the apartment buildings, they're uh, just generally anywhere. And there's actually an app you can get, uh, it's called uh, Balado Discovery, and it'll take you through a walking tour of, of the, all the murals, the history, why they were put there. Um, it, it, it's a few hours, you know, you can literally walk around our town and just wander around, look at pictures and, and listen to, to the descriptions of them. And while you're at it, you know, you check out Big Mouth McGee's, you go get your clubhouse sandwich, you go up to uh, Bon Appetit, you get yourself a milkshake, you head up to the new diamond, you get some, you know, chicken balls, you know, it's, and then you wander into Heidi's house and you go get your gummy frogs and beef jerky. <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> you, uh, I, I, I'm looking. So, as I said in our pre interview, one of my goals, whoever comes on this show, we're coming to your community. We're coming <laughs> to spend some economic tourism dollars in your community. So, I'm looking forward to some milkshakes, some gummy bears, I think. Like, it <laughs> seems like, wow. <laughs> what about yourself, though? After a stressful day at work, after a stressful council meeting, after a day you just want to decompress and just shut down, where do you go in the community that's your safe space, that sort of is the hidden gem that not even a lot of the locals may know? I think, I, I guess most of the locals would know it. Um, behind the church, uh, you know, there there's our community hall, there's a parking lot and whatever. But if you walk a couple... 100 feet further on you get a great view of just where the our creek runs through town you can see the cemetery uh, and you know there's flowering trees there's our little bridge the bike trails and you can just sit there and just chill you know uh grab some popcorn sit and relax you know it it's just a nice place to you know to be calm i guess <laughs> You, you talked about uh, some of the festivities, festivals that you have over the summer. Nate, what are some that we could potentially come see in the summer if we were up there? Well, the last weekend of July is always our Fete de Village. A uh, huge town festival. Friday night is family night. Free food, free games. You've free got me. Food. Free food? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. 
it's a great night. It's and it's all about family fun. Uh, you know, the supermarket brings out hot dogs. Last year, MLA was making snow cones. Um, we've got the candy booth going and all that kind of fun stuff. Saturdays, uh, there's uh, petting zoos, uh, beer gardens for, you know, the older folks. There's escape rooms. There's uh, food trucks, the soapbox derby, the parade. Uh, oh, a whole mess of stuff. Sunday is our demolition derby which uh, just on that Sunday alone, our population triples. <laughs> so it, it, it's just a huge weekend. It's all volunteer driven uh, wow. and all the proceeds go back into the fight and they distribute that those fundraising dollars to the kids baseball, the soccer, the hockey, the chamber, the, you know, whoever helps to operate it. Uh, some of the funds go back into those organizations as well. You have painted an amazing picture of your community. So I leave with this last question. Uh, I was going to call you your worship, but I'm not going to. Mayor <laughs> Joan, um, what makes the town of Legal such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think we touched on that already. It's You're going to get that smile. You're going to get that wave. You're going to be included. Um no matter where you come from across the country, the world, wherever, you're always going to find a piece of your community here. You're going to find a piece of yourself here. And I think, I, I think that's our biggest draw. We're, we're a community um, and we're not going to exclude people ever, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and it, it's just perfect. Well, Mayor Jones, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me for the last 40 minutes and talking about your community. Um, like I said, I'm looking forward to getting up this uh, over the next few months to visit your community once again, because I've driven through it once or twice, but I have never stopped in to see the 42 French murals, which I am so looking forward to now. And hopefully my tra built-in translator of a husband will come with me to translate everything <laughs> for me. Everybody's um, welcome. Come on down. Come exactly. find me. I'll take you on the tour myself. <laughs> well, there you go. We'll go grab a coffee and a clubhouse and maybe a beer as well. So um, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting about your community. Oh, well, thank you for having me. This has been fun. So with that, as I say, always uh, get off social media, put down your phone and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.